Hi, welcome back to this chapter 9 of the Little Book Evaluation. In this session, I want to focus on what I think is the most depressing type of company to value, which is a declining company. And let's think about what it is about declining companies that throw us off. The first is if you look at their history, their revenues are not growing, they're actually shrinking or stagnant. Their margins are often decreasing, they might have gone from profits to losses. Rather than adding to assets and investing in things, they're divesting assets. Why? Because they need the cash and they're trying to get out of businesses. Their cash flows can actually be the cash payouts in form of the dividends and buybacks can often be disproportionately large because the company is actually becoming smaller. And finally, the question of what they're doing with all that cash can make a big difference in whether they end up these hopelessly overlevered companies or companies that are relatively healthy. What I mean by that is when you divest assets, you get cash. You can use the cash to pay dividends and buybacks, which is fine, but if you, that's all you're doing, your equity shrinks over time, but your debt can stay high. So leverage can often be a wild card with declining companies. So with that commonalities in place, let's think about the valuation issues. The first, as I said, is a psychological one, which is as human beings, I think we're hardwired to be optimistic and upbeat. So when you look at the historical data, what you're seeing is negative stuff. Margins are shrinking, you know, uh, the revenues are decreasing over time. And in the aggregate, the company might be earning well below its cost of capital. Again, not by itself mathematically a problem, but psychologically a problem. Adding to the psychological problem, when you do valuation, you're trained to subtract out reinvestment from after-tax operating income to get to free cash flow, right? That's the way we set up the equation. So when you think about a healthy company of $100 in earnings, you think about how much of the 100 am I reinvesting back into the business to grow. When you look at declining firms, rather than investing in new assets, you're divesting existing assets. Put simply, your reinvestment can be a negative number. You're actually taking money out of the company. And even if you overcome all of these challenges and come up with expected cash flows and value for a declining firm, you have to consider the possibility that this company might not make it to nirvana. Nirvana and a DCF is getting to year 10 or year 5 in computing your terminal value. There's a very real chance your company might not make it. And if it does make it to Nirvana and become a mature company, it could very well be one of those companies where the growth rate in perpetuity is not just lower than the growth rate of the economy, but could be zero or negative. Your company could shrink in perpetuity. Now, none of this is insurmountable in valuation, but they're all challenging. For, again, for a psychological reason, because it's not something you do much of the time when you value companies. Now let's look at the pricing issues. When you price a declining company, just like you price any other company, you first have to choose a scaling variable. You think, what's the big deal? Remember, your revenues are shrinking over time rather than growing. Your, loss, or your profits have become losses. Your cash flows might actually be greater than your earnings. All of those things can cause, you know, cause a challenge when you think about what do I scale my market value to. Now, in terms of a peer group, if your company is the only declining or company or one in distress in a company full of healthy growing companies, you can already see comparing your company's pricing ratios, PE, EV to EBITDA, price to book to those healthy companies can give you a very misleading picture of whether your company is under or overvalued. It is true that if you're in a sector where a lot of companies are in decline or in distress, you might be able to get away just comparing them directly. But even there, you could argue that the degree of decline and distress can vary across companies. And finally, speaking specifically about distress, pricing always is a challenge when you might not make it as a company. And this is a challenge we face with young growth companies that we're again going to face at the other end of the life cycle with declining companies. Now, in terms of valuation solutions, here's what you need to think about. The first is when you value a declining company, you got to ask a question about the decline. The question is, is that decline reversible or permanent? If it is reversible, then maybe you can do what you did with mature companies. Ask the question, will a different management be able to deliver positive growth? But let's say it's irreversible, that this is not something that came from bad management, but from being in a business that's shrinking. If it is not reversible, then you got to build that into your forecast. Now, you can't fight reality. 
If you are value a tobacco company and the revenues are dropping 5% a year because fewer people are smoking, you got to build in that negative growth rate into your revenues. The second question is about distress, right? Is this company likely to make it? So both the decline and the distress, you got to ask questions before you follow through. The example I'm going to use in this chapter is a company called Bed Bath & Beyond. Bed Bath & Beyond is a brick and mortar retail company that soared in the 1990s, big success story, but has since fallen on hard times. In fact, at the time that I valued this company in 2022, or 2023, the company's revenues, which had been two, you know, 12.3 billion in 2017, had dropped to 7.4 billion. Revenues had dropped by almost 40%. Its operating profits had become losses. And it was shutting down stores rather than opening stores. That had all the characteristics of company in decline. Shrinking revenues, profits have become losses. It's divesting, closing down, selling off assets. So to value Bed Bath & Beyond, you have to factor in those issues. Now, before we actually look at the valuation of Bed Bath & Beyond, let's think about the possibility of failure. Now, again, this is something we've dealt with off and on in the previous chapters as well. But declining companies, it might be, it might be something that's not insignificant, a significant chance of failure. Now, of course, as in the previous chapters, you might say, why can't I bring it into the cost of capital? because it's not designed to capture it. And if there is a probability of failure, you've got to assess the likelihood that your company will fail. It's not easy to do, but you have to do it. And what your assets will be worth in the event of failure. You sell the assets, what are you going to get? So I would suggest that if you are worried about distress or failure, that you do the same thing we did with young startups, which is value the company as a going concern first put your optimist hat on, then put your pessimist hat on, ask yourself, what is the chance I will fail and what will the assets be worth if I fail? So to try this on Bed Bath & Beyond, here's what I started with. I put my optimist hat on and I projected out revenues and operating income for the next few years. So if you look at my story, it's not an upbeat story. So even with my optimist hat on, I see revenues continuing to shrink, go from 7.1 billion to buy it down to 5.9 billion. In effect, I'm seeing Bed Bath & Beyond shrink as a company, get rid of the stores that are not pulling their weight, but go back to being a steady state company where they can actually grow. There is a subset of consumers out there who like Bed Bath & Beyond. I'm assuming the company can find them by the time it gets to year 10. So by the time I get to year 10, my revenues are 5.9 billion. This is a slimmer, healthier company. Healthier in what sense? It's operating losses, it's operating margin, which right now is minus 1%, becomes 5.54%. Again, not an upbeat story. That's pushing me towards the average for the sector over time. So as I shut my less profitable stores, I go back to my core stores, my margins improve, my losses turn to profits. Now, if you look at the reinvestment, it's negative for the first seven, eight years. So you're saying, what does that mean? I'm shrinking as a company. I'm shutting down stores. I'm getting, you know, essentially a way to extract some of the money that I've invested in these stores out. That reinvestment reflects my story that this is going to be a shrinking company. My free cash to the firm is actually higher than my operating income because of that negative reinvestment, because of that divestiture, so to speak. So my cash flows are actually higher up front, lower later on, and I discount them back at the cost of capital. Again, high up front because the distress risk is high, this is a risky company, but over time I move that towards what a more mature, you know, more a healthier company will earn. So in my story, Bed Bath & Beyond becomes smaller over time, becomes more focused on a customer base that likes it and is able to deliver profits. That's my, that's my optimist side speaking. And to complete this valuation after year 10, remember now I've reduced my stores to stores that customer, customers will actually shop at. I'm able to grow those cash flows now at 3% a year forever. My cost of capital in steady state, I'm not going to be, you know, my, even with my optimist hat on, I don't see Bed Bath & Beyond being able to earn more than the cost of capital. So I set the return on capital at the cost of capital which gives me a 7.5% return on capital. To grow at 3% with a 7.5% return on capital, I need to reinvest 40%. So I take my operating income in year 11. 
I net out the 40% reinvestment rate, and I divide by the cost of capital minus the growth rate in perpetuity, I come up with the terminal value of 3.3 billion. So I discount all the cash flows you saw in the previous table and the terminal value back to today. I mop up, I add the cash, I subtract out the market value of debt, and I divide by the number of shares outstanding, I get a value per share of $4.89, assuming Bed Bath & Beyond makes it as a company, becomes a going concern. Is there a chance Bed Bath & Beyond will not make it? Absolutely. To assess the likelihood of failure, I actually cheated. Cheated in what sense? I let somebody else assess this risk for me. S&P had rated Bed Bath & Beyond as a single B-rated company in 2022. And if you look at the history of single B-rated companies, the cumulative default risk, the chance that a single B-rated bond will default in the next 10 years is about 32%. That's going to be my failure risk at Bed Bath & Beyond. There's a 32% chance they will not make it. And as an equity investor, if you ask me how much will my equity be worth if they don't make it, the answer is nothing. They owe enough money that I'm not going to be able to get any value for my equity. So I have two values for my equity. $4.89 with Bed Bath & Beyond surviving and becoming a going concern. And zero if that doesn't happen. And since I attach a 32% chance that it, will not, that it will not make it, I come up with an expected value per share of $3.33. At the time I did this valuation, Bed Bath & Beyond was trading at about $6.00. But remember, the story I'm telling underlying my valuation here is not an upbeat story. It's a story of survival and making it as a going concern. And this value incorporates the chance that they will not make it. Now, in terms of pricing declining companies, you know, if you can find a group of distressed companies in your sector, then you might be able to compare the price to book ratios or something similar and say this is the cheapest company. It, the problem, of course, is finding that many di distressed companies or declining companies in your sector can be problematic. So if I compare Bed Bath & Beyond to other retail firms, the only multiple that I could use in 2022 was a revenue multiple because that you know, earnings were negative. They were trading at a half of revenues, which made them look cheap relative to the typical retail company which traded about 0.8 times revenues. But I'm not going to be too quick to jump in and buy the stock because it looks cheap, because I think Bed Bath & Beyond is far more distressed than the typical Bed Bath, you know, the typical brick and mortar retail company. Maybe if I could pick a subset of, of those you know, brick and mortar retail companies that are in trouble, facing decline, like Bed, you know, facing distress, like Bed Bath & Beyond, maybe I can compare the, the multiple. But you can see the dangers of comparing any pricing multiple for a declining distress company to an industry average. They almost always look cheap because you're not controlling for the things you need to. You could try some of the things we suggested with um, young growth companies, use a forward multiple just for distress. But it's going to be challenging when you're looking at declining companies to be able to do any of that stuff. So as you sit, as you complain about doing an intrinsic value and valuation of declining companies and all the assumptions you have to make, remember, you will face many of those same challenges when you price these companies. I hope you found the session useful and thank you very much for listening.